Well, hey, welcome to First Church. So glad you guys are here. Looks like we have a great crowd here today. I know we've got hundreds of people joining us online as well. So if you are here in person, would you put your hands together and say hello to our online family? Let them know we're glad that they're worshiping with us. And if you couldn't tell from the clips that we just showed, last Sunday was an incredible day here at First Church. So we had Commitment Sunday. And for me personally, seeing different individuals and families come forward and commit to Unstoppable, it was moving, it was encouraging, it was inspiring. And hopefully you had a chance to be part of that. But if not, we still want to give you the opportunity to do that. In your pew today... At the back of the pew, there's a commitment card that you can fill out. You can drop it off in one of our offering boxes, or you can actually scan the QR code that's on the screen right now. You, you can commit, you can text commit to 918 300 3977. That'll take you right to our online commitment card if you want to do it either of those two ways. And you can be part of Unstoppable as well because we want 100% engagement. And on December the 5th, we're going to be announcing our number, our uh, expected gifts and commitments. And we are excited to be able to announce that number. And we want you to have a chance to be a part of just that. So you're not going to want to miss December the 5th. And we're also on December the 5th. It's going to be our first Big Give Sunday. So we want to start this unstoppable initiative with a bang. I mean, we want to go off with a bang. We want to be huge and big. So be praying about that Sunday. I think it's going to be another day that we will never forget. But thank you so much to your commitment. And I'm just so proud of our church and where we are right now. And I'm also excited about today because we wrapped up our unstoppable series last Sunday. And it's not quite Christmas yet. So we're kind of in this interim period. And the sermon that I want to preach today is one that I'm really excited about, even though it's a little different. And I'm going to ask you just to hang with me. You may have heard of this Instagram account. It's called Miserable Men. And basically, it posts pictures of men who go shopping with their wives or their girlfriends, and they're miserable. They don't really want to be there. And I love some of these pics, like this one right here of this dude. I mean, he looks miserable, doesn't he? He looks like he's being punished, like he's been set in the corner or something. And so he's hanging on to his wife's drink and her bag, but he definitely doesn't want to be there. How about this guy? I mean, he's just kind of given up. You know, I mean, he's going to put his wife's purse to good use, use it as a pillow. He's going to take a nap as he waits. How about this guy right here? Yeah, he has resorted to prayer because I think he's at the point where he's like, God, just save me from this mall. You know, he is ready to move on. And how about this man right here? You know, he was tired of standing around, so he decided to use his kid's stroller as a seat. I would be lying to you if I said that I hadn't thought about doing this. I have before, never actually done it, but I've thought about it on multiple different occasions. But this last guy is my favorite because he just completely gives up you know head cocked back mouth wide open he does not care anymore he's miserable he falls asleep and I love these pictures for many different reasons but one reason is because they illustrate a point about life you know life isn't always full of thrilling and exciting experiences like sometimes life is full of experiences that we would consider to be very dull and boring mundane we may even call them ordinary. But here's the thing. In my experience, what I've learned is that you should never look past those ordinary moments in life. You should never overlook what we might consider to be a boring, less than thrilling moment, because those are the moments that God can use. You see, what I have discovered is God often uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary, and he works sometimes when we don't even realize that he's doing so. And we need to be open for him to work even in our ordinary experiences. You guys know that for the past few weeks, we've been in this series called Unstoppable, and we've been looking at the book of Acts, and we've been diving into some really thrilling and exciting moments in the early history of the church, and we'd wrapped up the series last week, but, you know, we talked for the past several weeks about the birth of the church, and how thousands of people came to know Jesus at one time, and about how miracles were done to the apostles, and God sent earthquakes to open up prison gates and doors and unlock chains, and we saw how the gospel spread all throughout the Roman Empire. I mean, we studied some of these exciting, thrilling moments in the early history of the church, but today we're done with that series. And so I'm going to look at a passage that at least on the surface doesn't seem to have that same wow factor. In fact, some people would consider this passage very boring, very dull, but I want to let you know it's in there for a reason. It's actually found in the next book after Acts, the book of Romans, in the very last chapter of Romans, Romans chapter 16. And you know what it is? It's a list, just a list of names, and not just any names, 
really, really hard to pronounce names. And a lot of people would consider it kind of dull. But here's the thing, Paul, he's in Corinth right now. And he's getting ready to leave to go to Rome and eventually to Spain to expand the gospel even more. And Paul, he's about 60 years old right now, and he's got one good ministry left in him, he feels like. And so he gets ready to pack up his stuff, but before he does, he sits down to write a letter to the church in Rome. He's never been to the church in Rome before, but he's heard that many friends, Christian friends that he's met over the years as he's traveled throughout the empire have migrated to Rome, and they're all attending the church there. So before he leaves, he sends them a letter. And in this letter that we call the book of Romans, Paul talks about some really deep, big theological truths and themes But then he ends this letter with a list, a list of names of people who he wants to say hello to. And that's what I want to look at today. So read with me if you would, hang with me as I try to pronounce these names, okay? Paul writes, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my relatives, who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampelitus, who I love in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. And my dear friend, Stachus, greet Apellus, tested and approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my relative. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me, too. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegion, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers with them. Greet Philogus, Julia, Nersus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. Now, you don't have to apologize if you didn't get all excited as I read through that passage, okay? Don't feel bad, don't feel guilty if your heart didn't go all a flutter, you know, as I read through those names. I get it. It's a bunch of names. Not just any names, it's a list of really strange names that are hard to say. I've got four degrees in theology and I still struggle to read some of those names. I get it. This is a passage that typically in our preaching we kind of skip over. I haven't heard a whole lot of sermons on this passage. In fact, I have never ever preached on this passage before. It just feels like Paul is calling the church role. Kind of boring, kind of mundane, kind of dull, really. But sometimes calling the role is important. I graduated from Johnson Bible College in 2007. Here's a picture of Allison and me on the night of my graduation. We were engaged at the time, not married yet. In fact, I showed this picture to some of our staff this week, and Tim Tibble said, that looks like your wife, but who's that guy with her? So apparently, he doesn't think that that looks like me now, but that's all right. But that was the night of my graduation. And I remember on that night, there were a whole lot of names that were called. Now, Johnson is a small Christian college, And it's a tight-knit community. And I knew just about everybody in my class. I was my class president. So as each name was called, I knew it wasn't just a name. There was a story behind all those names. And I remember one girl, her name was called. And when she walked across the stage, she had tears in her eyes. And I knew why. Because this girl, she had an older brother who was also a student at Johnson. He was studying to be a missionary. He was a couple years older than us. And while he was on a mission trip, he was cutting down a tree. The tree fell on him and killed him. And some people may have abandoned the church or got mad at God in a moment like that. But not this girl. She was more on fire for God than ever. And it's because she knew that her brother hadn't died in vain. And she went on to graduate 
with a degree in children's ministry. She married a preacher and she's still involved in ministry to this day. There was another guy who walked across the stage. His name was called. And he walked across the stage with a smile on his face. But I knew his story as well. His parents didn't want him going to Bible college because they didn't want him becoming a minister. They wanted him to make more money than that. And he wasn't even sure if his parents were going to show up the night of graduation, but they ended up coming. And when he looked at and saw them in their seats, he smiled. There was another girl whose name was called. She was the first person in her family to ever graduate college. And even though our academic dean, he came up beforehand and did the usual spill when he said, hey, save your applause to the end. Don't clap till the very end. When that girl walked across the stage, her family, who had never had a college graduate in their family before, they let out a roar of applause and nobody thought anything about it. My roommate walked across the stage and he was a great guy who loved Jesus and loved the church, but he struggled when it came to studying and academics. And I remember the night of our finals as seniors, he was studying hard because he had to make a certain grade to pass this one class in order to graduate. And he and I studied and studied and studied together so he could just get a passing grade. And he did pass, barely, but he passed. And when he walked across stage, he was so relieved, so happy when they called his name. And I remember hearing my name called. And I walked across stage and I looked out at the audience and I saw my family, my parents, Allison, my grandparents, they were all so proud. It's more than just a list of names that night. And when we come to Romans chapter 16, this is more than just a list of names. This is more than Paul just calling the role. Even though I've heard very few sermons on Romans chapter 16 before, There was one sermon that I got to hear a recording of. It was preached years ago by a guy named Dr. Fred Craddock. He taught preaching for years at Emory University, and he preached on this passage several years ago, and when I heard this recording, I was inspired to preach on it as well, and I'm going to give Fred Craddock a lot of credit for me preaching this message today, because I probably would have never done it if I'd heard that sermon. And one thing that Fred said in that sermon was this. He says, it seems like Paul is just calling the role, but for Paul, this isn't just a list. Don't call it a list. The roll call gives us sort of a sociological profile of the membership of the church. I mean, did you pay attention to some of these names? Did you catch who Paul is writing to? First of all, we see that there's a husband and a wife listed here, Aquila and Priscilla. And he's writing to them together who apparently serve Christ together. There's also some other people listed here, like a man and his mother, Rufus and his mother, we're not, we don't get her name. Maybe he was a mama's boy, I don't know, but still, Rufus and his mother are listed. There are some sisters, our brother and a sister uh, listed here. Narius and his sister. Again, I don't know why he just, Paul just says his sister and not the sister's name. Again, Paul's like 60 years old. Maybe he just forgot her name, I don't know, you know. I can see her face, but I don't know her name. Some brothers here, Adronicus and Junius, or even some more sisters here, uh, Tryphenia and Tryphosa. I bet you they were twins. You can just see it in their names, can't you? I bet they were twins, I'm sure. They probably wore the same outfit every Sunday to church. I guarantee it, but okay. What about Eponidas, the first convert in Asia? Probably an old man by this point. There's a single lady here, Mary. And there's a single man listed as well, Herodian. Were they widowed? Were they always single? Did they never marry? Did they ever date, maybe? I mean, who knows? We don't know, right? But it's an interesting list, sort of, not really. (laughs) But for Paul, it wasn't a list. Don't call it a list. See, Paul's at Corinth and he's getting ready to leave and I think as he packs up the few belongings that he has, I think he comes across some old keepsakes, maybe even a letter or two for some of his old friends. And as he goes through all these mementos, he starts to reminisce a little bit and think about people who have impacted him over the years. You ever done this? Hanging in our bedroom, Alcimine's bedroom, is this plaque right here. It's not there currently because I have it with me, but normally it hangs in my bedroom. And it's a plaque or piece of wood that has the state of Kentucky carved on it. And it was given to me on my last day at the last church I served. They had a going away party for me. And everybody who was at that party signed their name on this plaque. We keep it hanging in our bedroom. And every now and then when I walk past this plaque, I'll stop and I'll read the names. 
And I started to take a trip down memory lane. You know, if you were to look at this plaque right now, you would see the name Bill. Bill was my neighbor. He was also an elder in our church. Bill used to mow my yard for me. I never asked him to. He just did. I don't know if it's because he thought my grass was too tall or he was just being nice, but still, he would mow my yard for me. He was being nice. And he did a lot, especially when I was working on my doctorate because he knew I was busy, young family, trying to get a doctorate degree, and he mowed my yard a lot. Chester and Sarah's names are on this plaque as well. They were older by the time that I came to the church, but even though they had grandchildren by the time that I knew them, they decided to become foster parents in their older age. They started to let kids that they didn't know live with them because they wanted to provide them a Christian foundation because they knew they may not have that. Tim's name is on here. Tim was a youth minister that I served with, and now he and his wife Edith, they're missionaries in Japan. There's John and Phyllis on here. John and Phyllis live right behind the church, and when Allison's dog died, they offered to bury her dog in their backyard, and we did. Sean and Anastasia's names are on here. They were our close friends, and they struggled to get pregnant. I remember we prayed with them, and we cried with them, and they eventually got pregnant. It took some time, and when their daughter was born, we were one of the first people who came to the hospital to celebrate with them. William's name is on here. William was also one of my elders. And William only got mad at me one time in my entire 10 years of that church. And he got mad at me on the day that I came to him and told him that I was leaving to come to Oklahoma. And he was mad. I mean, I'm serious. He was mad. And he came back later and apologized. And he said, no, Chad. He said, I was being selfish. I know God is in this. Don't call this a list. It's so much more than that. It's so much more than just a bunch of names. And I think that's how Paul feels about Romans chapter 16. You see, when he talks about these people, he gives us some details about them. Like Aquila and Priscilla, he says, they risk their lives for me. Have you ever known somebody like this who has made huge sacrifices for you so that you can be where you are today? He also mentions Andronicus and Junius. He says, they were in prison with me. You ever had those close friends, Christian friends that have been with you through the tough times and they went through the valley with you? That's them. What about Mary? Mary, he says, was a hard worker. I bet you Mary was the last one to leave church. I bet she was the one who cleaned up all the trash and turned out the lights. You ever known people like that? I think of a guy named Garnet at the last church that I served. He was always the last one to leave, always cleaning up. And I remember there were times that I would say, Garnet, go on home. And he would say, no, Chad, you go on home. I can't do what you can do, but I can clean up. What about Epinetus, the first convert that Paul had in Asia? I think about the first person that I ever baptized, a guy named Scott. He was a fifth grader, and I was in junior high. I taught his VBS class, vacation Bible school, and at the end of that week, he wanted to be baptized, and we baptized him into Christ, and Scott went on to lead his entire family to Jesus. They had never attended church before, but he ended up leading his entire family to Jesus after that. I think about Parfenia and Trifosa, again, I think they were twins, I'm sure. And I bet you Paul's, he wrote down their names and I never could tell them apart, you know, but they were always there, always faithful. What about Rufus? He says, tell Rufus hello and his mother, who is like a mother to me. Can you imagine having that reputation of being the adopted mother of, a, of an apostle? How cool would that have been? I can just picture this now. You know, Mama Rufus. Paul would stop by the house and Mama Rufus would say, hey, Paul, you need to eat something. No, I'm busy. I got stuff to do. Paul, you may be an apostle, but you're not leaving until you have my tea. Can't you just picture her wearing her apron and saying that? I can. And I think of Mama Ruthie. You don't know Mama Ruthie, but she was an older lady in the last church I served. She was like an adopted grandma to me and Allison and our kids. And she was so special to us that at the height of COVID, When everything was shut down, locked down, I traveled 10 plus hours back to Kentucky to do her funeral. That's how much she meant to me. Don't call this a list. It's so much more than that. You know, when I was in the fifth grade, I got to travel to Washington, D.C. for the very first time. And I remember seeing the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. And for some people, it may just be a long wall full of names but not for everyone. 
These are more than just names. I saw people placing flowers by this wall. I saw people running their fingers down these names, trying to find a certain name, and when they got there, they started to cry. I saw people bringing little kids and pointing to where a name on the wall was. Don't call that a list. It's so much more than that. I got to receive something not too long ago. It's a baptismal certificate from 1953. And this baptismal certificate, probably if you found it in an estate sale or a yard sale, probably wouldn't bring very much money. No one probably would want it, but I wanted it because of the name that was on it. Dudley Tapp, that's my grandfather's name. He passed away not too long ago. And Dudley Tapp was a huge patriarch in our family. He was an elder in the church at Springfield, Christian Church in Springfield, Kentucky. For years, he influenced tons of of lies, but then there's another name on here, Tom Thurman, who was the minister of the church who baptized my grandpa. And Tom Thurman not only baptized my grandpa, and I remember my grandpa telling the story, he said that he was a teenager and he hadn't accepted Jesus yet, and Tom Thurman stopped by his house and said, Dudley, you've been in church long enough, you know what you need to do, you know the good news of Jesus Christ, you need to go and accept it, and he did, and he went and he was baptized. Thank goodness, thank God for Tom Thurman. But Tom Thurman, he was a minister of the church at the time. He left, and he came back for a revival years later. And during that revival, my mom came forward to accept Jesus. And then years after that, when I was a student at Johnson Bible College, I went to our mail room, and people used to just leave things in the mail room that were free for people to take, and old preachers would drop off their books, or there were cassette tapes. Now, cassette tapes for you younger guys, you listen to those, okay? They had, like, music and stuff on them, but you could also put sermons on there you can listen to, and there was a cassette tape there that had a sermon by Tom Thurman on it. And I recognized that name because I'd heard my mom and grandpa talk about him, so I got the tape, and I was going through a really rough season And I put that tape in my car, because cars had cassette players back then, and I put that cassette in my car, and I listened to Tom's sermon as I drove. And I remember pulling off the side of the road at the end of that sermon and saying, God, I'm in this for the long haul. Whatever it takes, I surrender my life to what you want. Thank God for Tom Thurman. Dudley Tapp, Tom Thurman, Springfield Christian Church, just names to some people. But there's so much more than that. And in Romans 16, those aren't just names for the Apostle Paul. For for the Apostle Paul, that was family. God's family. His family. It was a portrait of what the church is supposed to be. He was where he was in his life right now because of those names. They may seem like ordinary people to everyone else, but they were extraordinarily special to the Apostle Paul. And when I think of First Church, there's a lot of names that come to mind. I think of Mr. Phil who has suckers for our kids every single week. My kids cannot leave without getting a sucker from Mr. Phil. I think about Julie, one of the first people we met in our church that wasn't like a church leader or staff member. And Julie was our realtor, came to church here. And she became an instant friend, and she's been a friend for the past four years And she will continue to take Allison out to eat to encourage her. She will drop by gifts for my kids. I don't think she's missed a birthday party for my kids since we've been here. I think about Matt and Steph Thomason. When I first got here, I wasn't trying to read Matt, you know. He can be kind of intimidating. He's a lot bigger than I am, you know. I couldn't ask for a better executive minister. couldn't ask for a better friend than Matt. Even though he hugs me a lot now, and that kind of makes me feel uncomfortable. And he doesn't just hug. Like, he wrestled. So, you know, he, like, hugs you. And it's like, get off me, man. But anyway, that's a different story. But, and then Steph has been such an encourager to Allison as well as the rest of our minister's wives. I think about Ben Killian and the influence that he had over my life. There are so many names. I could keep going. I could go on and on and on. Mike and Sharon have been like grandparents to my kids. and Ben, who never sees me on a Sunday without telling me that I preached a good sermon, whether I did or not. There's a lot of names. But one name that is on that list is, a, is Tim, Tim Tibbles. And uh, Tim tells me every single Monday that I preach too long. So anyway, I'm going to move on, okay, so that he doesn't have to tell me that. No, he always does in a joking way. But guys, it's not a list. It's family. 
It's God's family. It's my family. And I know there are names on your list right now. And for most people looking at the names that I just mentioned, they would see them as ordinary people, but God uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. And I've seen it happen over and over and over again in my life. And one other name that would be on my list, I got a bunch of other names, but another name that'd be on my list is another Ben. I've already mentioned two of them. Here's a third one. His name is Ben Kacharis. Ben is the lead minister of Mountain Christian Church just outside of Baltimore. It's a church of 6,000 people in a very unchurched area. And I'll never forget the first time that I went to a conference that's for guys who are at churches of 1,000 people or more, 1,000 average attendants or more. It was when I first came here to First Church. Never been to this conference. Didn't even know it existed, really. And I went to this conference, and I sat down at a table with a bunch of guys who are at churches that are like 5,000 people. 10,000 people. These are guys who had written Christian books and were big names, you know, in the church. And I felt very out of place. In fact, the one thing that kept running through my mind is that song from Sesame Street. You know, one of these things is not like the other thing. One of these things just doesn't belong. That's what kept playing in my head over and over again. And Ben Kacharis came up to me and said, hey, Chad, I remember my first time coming to this conference. He said, I want to let you know you're here for a reason. You're here because God wants you here. And God's going to use you to do big things. Ben asked me to be part of a cohort that he was forming of young guys in large churches that he could help mentor. And I agreed, and it was so beneficial. And Ben has become a mentor to me. He's on my list now. And he shared a story with me not too long ago about a name that impacted his life. And I thought about telling you that story, but instead I asked him to tell it. Take a look at this video. Well, hello, my friends at First Church in Owasso. I'm Ben Kacharis from Mountain Christian Church in Maryland, and Chad asked me to tell you a story. But first, I just have to tell you how excited I am about what God is doing at First Church. Um, I've been watching and marveling at how you're growing and reaching new people over the years, and I'm so thankful for you and the way you love Jesus and love like Jesus, as your mission and motto says. I also just want to take a minute and say to you, First Church, I hope you know you all have an amazing pastor. I, I know the entire staff is great, but I get to travel and work with churches all over the country. And let me just tell you, Chad and Allison are special. You know, Chad and I, we have had a chance to spend a good bit of time together over the last few years. We've prayed together about what's happening at your church, and I can tell you, he loves you guys so much. And he's on top of that, humble and down to earth, and except for that whole Kentucky Wildcat thing, he's just a great guy, and I'm glad he's my friend, and that he asked me to share something with all y'all. What I want to share with you is a true story about a young man who was about 16 years old when the story starts, uh, about 1909, okay? He lived in a tiny rural village near a place called Kalimata, Greece. Very poor family, just a few goats and sheep, things like that. But he had a dream of building a better life. So he goes to his father and he says, you know, I want to go to America. I want to make some money and I'll come back and I'll help the family. Well, of course, they were a little sad about that, but they agreed it was what he would do. So they saved up some money, sold a couple of goats, bought him a ticket for what turned out to be a very long, about a month long boat ride with some harrowing stories to say along the way. But finally, he arrived in New York City, Ellis Island, where thousands of other immigrants were also pouring in. He didn't know anyone, he didn't speak a lick of English, and he only had a few dollars in his pocket. In fact, he lost some of that money when a taxi driver tricked him into paying a lot of money for really just driving around the block a few times and before dropping him off at a tenement house that first night where he stayed. He washed his shirt in a sink and hung it out to dry on a banister overnight, but it was gone in the morning. So he wasn't getting a very good welcome to America. He eventually found his way all the way across the country to Omaha, Nebraska. He got a low paying job in a factory, he worked very hard, but his bosses were skimming some of his earnings. He got another job shining shoes in a barber shop, just trying to make ends meet. So one day, as he's shining shoes, this man came in with the rather unlikely name of Dr. John Baptist. <laughs> For real, that was his Americanized name. He was a medical doctor of Armenian descent, and he spoke Greek, which is the language, of course, that that young man spoke. And as he was getting his shoes shined by this kid, maybe reading his newspaper or whatever, he noticed the boy. 
looks over his newspaper, begins to speak to him in his native tongue. Kalemera, he says to the boy down by his shoes, which means good day, hello. And it's a conversation in, ensues. And, and the young boy, of course, lights up because someone's talking to him in his native tongue and have this whole conversation where he says to the young boy, you can do better than this. You can make a better life for yourself. You could be teaching English to other kids. You could maybe be a teacher. And the young boy's like, well, how could I ever do that? I don't even know English myself. I don't have any way to do anything. He says, well, you could, you could go to college one day. How could I ever go to college? He says, well, you can go to college where I went to college. Well, where's that? He says, it's a place called Johnson Bible College, a Christian university in Tennessee. Well, one thing led to another, and that doctor helped that boy write a letter to the then president, Ashley Johnson, and said, there's a young Greek boy who'd love to go to your school. Um, could you make room for him? He will he'll work on the farm to earn his room, board, and tuition, and uh, I'll help get him there. And sure enough, that young man found his way to Johnson Bible College, which, as you probably know, is the same place that your pastor Chad attended about a hundred years later. He was surrounded by Christian teaching and Christian people who were influencing him, and it started to make an impact on him. He was handed a Bible, a Greek New Testament, and finally something he could digest quickly, he thought, and he began to read for himself. He read about a lost son who had left home and was far from his father, but who finally came home. And he thought to himself, that's me. I, I want to come home. But he felt in his spirit that he wanted to come home in a way that meant something more than going back to Greece. So he went to chapel one day soon after that, and after a sermon made an invitation to trust Christ, he responded and committed to following Jesus and was baptized in the in the river there, and he never turned back. He went to the leaders of the college and he said, I want to preach. And they didn't know what to do with this kid. They said, okay, you can preach on the Sunday night service in a couple of weeks. They pointed to the hillsides where there was lots of smoke coming out of the chimneys. And he said, every time you see a smoke coming out of a chimney, that's a house. You can go tell any one of them you want to come hear you preach. And that's what he did. He knocked on all those doors and people came in droves because they wanted to know what in the world this interesting young man with the thick hard to understand Greek brogue would say. Well, he preached his heart out and he gave an invitation and several people came forward to receive Christ that very night and a fire was lit in his bones that never went out. And as that young man went on, he became a very powerful preacher, eventually known all over the country. And after a ministry in Iowa and marrying a wife in the year 1919, he went to Minnesota Bible College to lead the Greek department to help train up people for ministry. He became a father figure and a counselor and encourager to hundreds and hundreds of preachers and pastors and missionaries and chaplains and servants of God who left those halls to serve all over the world. He kept that college open through the Great Depression and his leadership and courage uh, and fundraising skill. He taught the scriptures, he poured into those students, and he served faithfully. Listen to this. He served from 1919 until 1983. His influence has spread all over the world to this day, and they say that the sun never sets on the ministry of that one man. He's spoken at conventions and conferences and started new churches. He preached faithfully at the Howard Lake Church, influencing so many people for 44 years. It was a huge encouragement to ministers and pastors everywhere. Through the years, he was blessed with four children, all of whom became followers of Christ and went into ministry of some kind or another. I know all of this so well because I've heard the story my whole life. Because that man, who began as a shoeshine boy from Greece, is my grandfather, G.H. Kacharis, or as Dean Kacharis, as he was often called. It's just staggering to think about the impact that came from his influence. Just for example, my father, one of his kids, uh, was a pastor himself, and all the people he ministered to and baptized and had an impact on over the years. And then my dad became a college professor at the same college for 30 years. I went to college, studied under my dad, and he taught countless other students how uh, you know to serve God. And my mom is a Christian author who worked for Standard Publishing and faithfully taught Sunday school to kindergartners for 60 years. I got uncles and aunts who were all believers. They had kids who became Christians. Many of them went into the ministry. My sister's a Christian author and a leader in her church. My brother's an elder in his 
his church. My cousin is a pastor. My other cousin is a pastor. It's just, it's amazing. One of the amazing things my grandfather did was start a Christian camp in northern Minnesota. It's called Pine Haven Christian Assembly back in 1941. And that's where I made my decision to follow Christ, where I got baptized in the lake. And years later, it's where I heard that same grandfather of mine preaching. I was in high school and he said, I believe someone here tonight called into ministry and if that's you I want you to come up here and stand by me and I knew I knew I knew it was me and I walked that little aisle of that chapel in the woods and I stood there with tears in my eyes and said I will give my life to the ministry of Jesus Christ and I'm a pastor today and God has blessed our church at Mountain we've had thousands baptized into Christ at our church new campuses and community centers and online ministry and churches we planted and now a hundred young people interns that have come through our place with a dream like my grandfather had about how God might use them. It's amazing, isn't it, to think how God does what he does. And part of what's amazing is that you can trace it all back to that moment when that young, invisible nobody of a kid was shining shoes in a barbershop. And someone who didn't have to stopped what they were doing, looked over their newspaper, and noticed him and it changed history. I love the heart of First Church and the way it's always had a concern for kids. And I love that you're making space, more space right now through your unstoppable initiative. It's so, so important. Remember, all it took was that one guy who stopped what he was doing to notice that child, someone who cared enough to give something, to say, I believe in you and I love you. And when you give kids a chance, man, I'm telling you, amazing things can happen. And I feel like that's what you're doing, First Church, in this unstoppable thing. You're noticing kids. You're making space for more kids. You're looking over the newspaper and the families that are going to be changed and the lives of young people who are going to know Jesus as a result. It's going to spread outward for generations to come. And our country and our cities and our families desperately need churches like yours to be unstoppable when it comes to reaching the next gen for kids. So keep going and finish strong. See this thing through because the next generation is going to see and experience because of what you're doing is going to be an amazing story. Some kid's going to be telling a story of how their family was changed because they got connected to Jesus right here. So thank you for your unstoppable commitment to do whatever it takes so many more will come to know the love of Jesus, to love Jesus and love like Jesus. God bless you all. You know, there were some names mentioned in that video. There's a college president, Ashley Johnson. There's a medical doctor, John Baptist. The Kacharises, a grandfather and grandson. Even Allison and me were mentioned. All of which are very ordinary people. But that God has brought together through his son, Jesus. And is using us to be part of his extraordinary plan. God wants to do the same thing here. If I were to print off all of the kids that we have in our kids' ministry right now, because we check them all in for security reasons, <laughs> I would have a packet probably that thick. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids. But don't call that a list. That's the present and the future of our church. There's another list right now that we have, and it's a running list. Of those of you who have faithfully and sacrificially committed to our unstoppable initiative, but don't call that a list. Those are people who are willing to give up what they love for those they love more. We have an angel tree out in our lobby right now. It was full of names this morning. I think you heard earlier all those names are gone because we realize those aren't just names, those are God's children. And we want to provide for them. And you never know, bringing a Christmas gift to a child like that whose parents, their parents are in prison. You just never know how God could use that. And one day, because of that small, ordinary act, you might be on their list. And by the way, if you still want to help out with that, even though the names are gone off the tree, go stop by that booth. They will take your name down. We'll find a way for you to help out in some way. Guys, don't call Romans chapter 16 a list. Don't call that plaque that hangs on my wall a list. Don't call all the names we have in our database that make up the membership of First Church a list. This isn't a list. This is family. This is our support group. This is, this is a group of people who are the reason why we're here today. And guys, here's the thing. 
We often say you can't take anything with you when you go to heaven. There is one thing you can take with you. It's your list. Not physically, but those on your list. And let's say one day you die and you go to stand before Jesus and you're at the gates of heaven and let's say you're allowed to take your physical list with you and Jesus says, what's that in your hand? And he already knows, but he still wants to see it and so you hand him your list of names. And he reads through that list and he reads them off one by one and he gets to the very bottom and he, after saying them all out loud, I can just picture Jesus saying, yep, I know all the people on this list because they're right inside these gates waiting to welcome you home. Don't call it a list. We all need a group of people like Romans chapter 16, and that's why we're here. First Church, we're in this thing together. And if we're going to get through everything that we face in this world, and if we're going to do everything that God is calling us to do, it's time that we stop seeing it as a list, and we, and we realize the great influences we have all around us, and we team up together together. And we, as one, do what God is calling us to do. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this day that we've had to open up your word and study it. And I pray that we can receive some encouragement from Romans chapter 16. I pray that we will be a people who go out and live for the calling that you have given us. But no, we're not in this thing alone. We're in this thing together. And may we continue to add names to our list so that one day we can all go home together. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen.